Now we're moving on to the third topic of chemical kinetics, which is all about experimental methods. Uh, so we've done a bit of theory on what a rate constant is and how it reacts to concentration. We've done quite a lot of theory on the kinetics of gases, especially uh, how does collision affect the rate. Now we're going to move on to how would we actually go about measuring some of this in a lab. You want to go out there and measure some stuff. So this is just going to be the basic breakdown of how we go about it. I'm not going to be discussing in this screencast in particular anything about specific details of the techniques, just a broad introduction to it. So we're going to start with experimental considerations about what do we really need to worry about uh, when we're trying to get this, because we want to get a rate constant to be accurate as possible, uh, not just you know make a guess here, we want to make it accurate, so that means require uh, figuring out a couple of the limitations uh, of the techniques. Uh, then we're going to do two methods, uh, one mixing quenching and the other in situ. So these are two different approaches that we can do to get rate constants. Uh, and they are quite conceptually different. One involves stopping a reaction, the other involves just letting the reaction go. Hence the word in situ, it means kind of in place uh, in the situation. So our first set of considerations. Uh, when we are measuring kinetics, all of our theory at this macroscopic level, remember that whole triangle thing, macro, micro, and the symbolic, uh, the math C world uh, interpretation. Uh, all of the observations of rates happen in a lab at the macroscopic realm. And that makes the assumption that at the microscopic realm, uh, collisions are happening and their collision frequency happens at a rate determined by concentration. Now that only works if the concentration is even. If it's not even, then our assumptions are starting to fall down. So in this case on the right here, that is two sets of products or two reactants well mixed together. You can see they're quite evenly distributed. There's not far for any of them to travel before they actually collide with each other. There is a reaction going to be happening pretty much everywhere. So not those two, those are the same molecule. So you can see everywhere. So if we shine some light through here and try and figure out what the absorption is, it's pretty neat. Uh, here, however, that's not the case at all. You can see that we've just dropped some of this green stuff into the middle and the concentration is really high here. So the kinetics of whatever's happening is going to be based around this concentration here. And you can imagine that might go really rapidly. Out here it's going to be going really slowly. So if the concentration isn't even, things fall down. So you will probably discover this um, in labs when we tell you to add things dropwise and to stir it. Uh, this is sort of a related reason. Um, we want to get things evenly mixed in order to get reliable results. If the concentration has something, the gradient in it, and it's more concentrated in one area and not in another, uh, our assumptions fall down. Our kinetics will not be reliable. Any measurement we do will be completely unreliable unless we can be sure that it is thoroughly, thoroughly mixed. So next, we want even temperature. This is it for the exact same reason. If things are even uh, throughout here, if we take a sample from here or we sample it here, we can see that it will be running at the same rate. Uh, here, however, <clears throat> is what you might expect in a lab. You might be sticking something on a hot plate or something. Um, I saw Bunsen burners these days. I was going to draw this with a flame underneath and then realized we don't actually use them. <laughs> Do we? We use hot plates. So you stick a hot plate under here and it warms up here first, obviously. That's really hot and this is quite cold. So if you sample from here, the rate's going to be much slower. Remember, higher temperature means things go a bit faster. The whole Arrhenius equation is a function of temperature. Things are going to be different. So if we sample from here, really quick. Here, kind of medium. Up here, slow. Even if we start shining light through here, the concentrations are going to be changing much more rapidly because the temperature isn't there. So what we need to do is make sure that the temperature is stable throughout uh, and even. Uh, the temperature should also be as stable as possible in time as well. So if you know you, you can expect some kind of error in measurement here, you might think that this is maybe 15.8 degrees C. Uh, well, actually it's probably fluctuating between maybe um, 16 
and 15.6. Okay, that is a point uh, 0.4 degree difference here. Maybe that's acceptable for what you're doing as an experiment. Maybe it's a bit too much. So you have to balance out how hard is it to get the temperature even versus how much accuracy you want. And the final consideration uh, is one that's often overlooked, but uh, it's still important. You need a clear way of distinguishing between your reactant and your product. So if you ever look at a diagram, and um, we talk about this schematically, you're likely to see something like this. The reactant, uh, if we take a spectrum of it, an infrared spectrum, for instance, the reactant will go down and the product will go up over time and increase. Um, and that's really clear and obvious. There is a distinction here. Uh, and we can see one peak grow in and one disappear. Really easy. Uh, more likely you're gonna see something like this. And this is a bit awkward, isn't it? Um, not here with this peak's going down, but this peak's coming up. And you might think, yeah, we can kind of get these tips and figure them out. But what tends to happen is if you get overlapping peaks, so here is the peak representing your product and here's the peak representing your reactant, uh, they will start combining together. So one side might go up and one might go down and maybe at the extremes of your reaction you'll get a reliable signal, but in the middle it's going to be a bit of a convoluted mess. So this is likely to what you'll, what you'll see. So in order to really track uh, a kinetic experiment accurately, you need to be able to distinguish between your reactant and product really clearly. Um, if you can't, you're in agony city. Uh, so let's just recap those considerations. We want to make sure things are mixed thoroughly. Uh, if they're not mixed thoroughly, concentrations differ from one part to another, you don't get an even reaction. Temperature, that also needs to be consistent. It needs to be consistent in space, as in your entire sample, and it also needs to be consistent in time. You don't want it to be wobbling too much. You want to keep it uh, very <coughs> um, what, stable. And then detection. We need to be able to detect a real difference between the products and the reactants. Otherwise, we are not going to be able to track any kinetics at all. And, that's... and the difference between the products will be and reactants that you need to look for will become clear as you go into these next few methods. So now I'm going to talk about quenching. Uh, now in the simplest uh, um, case, quenching just means stopping the reaction. Or we quench the reaction or stop it. Uh, both mean the same thing. Quenching is a you know, like posh sounding word. The easiest way to do that the absolute easiest is simply dilute it. So we take some of this, we dump it into another much larger beaker of solvent and the reaction slows down because you know rate is proportional to a concentration. So if we lower the concentration, we're gonna lower the rate. So while this may take several minutes to react, this might take several hours. So we get our reaction vessel, we take a little sample out of it and we go analyze that. And we've got a couple of minutes grace to go um, figure it out. Uh, we can also quench by adding something to stop the reaction. So if something is very reactive, we can add something that will react even faster just to mop it all up and take it out. We can also mop by cooling it down as well. Um, uh, so if we can chill it down to stop the reaction, we can dilute it to stop the reaction, or we can add something in there just to physically mop up anything that's reactive. Um, as long as we can do that, we can quench it. And then what do we do? We take samples at different times. So here we have, we'll just pick a bit of it and we dump it into here. And in this set of diagrams, I've just assumed that we're diluting it, not doing anything fancy to it. And what we can then do is just take these away with five minutes, 12 minutes, different kind of intervals, uh, and then do some analysis. Doesn't matter what that analysis is right now. We just do the analysis and we find the concentration and we might get a kinetic looking graph. So you can see the reactants come down here, the products go up. Uh, and yeah, this graph is actually based on the, uh, drawn from these molecules, the number of molecules of each and these minutes. Uh, so that is actually a, the graph representing the schematic diagram at the top. So if, even if the schematic diagram doesn't look particularly realistic, uh, this at least matches it. 
Uh, so the benefits limitations of this, this is something that we really need to get our heads around. So the benefits, we have fewer restrictions on the analysis method. Um, so that means we can take it away and we can do chromatography on it. We could take our sample and run it through gas chrom chromatography. We could titrate to figure out a concentration. We could go do NMR, IR, UV, whatever things that we need. We can even go and do mass um, analysis or something. And it's also relatively easy. You just set your reaction away, you take your reaction, you quench it, you go do your analysis. Uh, so you're very likely to come and find these in the teaching labs. Uh, so if you do kinetics in a teaching lab environment, you're likely to do a quenching type method. But it's limited. Uh, there are a lot of drawbacks to doing this mixing and quenching type method. Uh, for a start, we can only do it for slow reactions. If your reaction is done and dusted within a minute, uh, you're not going to be having a good time quenching it. It'll take you the best part of a minute to you know, do the quenching reaction. Uh, so if your reaction is going to last for about two or three hours, you can do this. Just take a sample every 15 minutes and you've got enough data points. Uh, you also must use relatively large volumes. So if you're taking a couple of milliliters out for analysis every time, you obviously need a couple of hundred to have a good reaction going. Uh, and your rapid quenching can actually be quite difficult. So imagine you're doing the cooling method where you want to get it from 50 degrees to, you know, maybe on an ice bath. How long is it going to take to quench a small sample down to, by 50 degrees? Probably a minute or so. So what that does, if this is your time and this is your concentration you've measured, and that's your data point, this quenching actually starts introducing an error in this kind of direction, in the time dimension. So if it takes you up to about a minute to quench, uh, you you don't have a data point that's exactly at one second. You've got a one second plus or minus maybe 30 seconds either side of it. Um, so that when we come to do kind of error analysis, uh, that's quite important. Uh, so it introduces new kind of errors that way. How can we get over that? Oh, <clears throat> well, sorry, let's just review. So what we need to do is mix the reagents uh, we quench by dilution, lowering the temperature, or adding something to mop it up, and detection, we can use multiple methods. That's a quick review of the quenching. How do we get over its limitations? We do in-situ measurements. Uh, this means everything's still in the reaction vessel, and then we just generate our graphs and kinetics. We're not extracting uh, individual samples here. We are just looking at it. So. We go straight from one thing to another, no sampling involved. So we get over a lot of those limitations, but we do introduce some new ones. Uh, so how do we go about measuring it? Uh, one thing we're going to be looking at is conductivity. So if a re reagent moves from, uh, let's just say it's A and B, and then it moves to A, and it's a positive charge, and B has a negative charge, conductivity is going to change. We can measure concentrations indirectly that way. Uh, obviously, spectroscopy is going to be a big one. Uh, now in practice, and this is probably the single biggest one that will be used for kinetics. So we want to shine some light through and we see uh, the intensity has gone down. So remember, via Lambert law, we can get a concentration out of the absorbance. So, sorry, the absorbance, concentration, uh, path length is that. Uh, so we can figure out a concentration from spectroscopy, uh, and we can also do pressure. So remember the ideal gas equation, pressure times volume is equals to the moles uh, times gas constant times temperature. So remember, pressure doesn't really have that much to do with mass. It is about the number of entities there. So when we looked at that microscopically, that was an individual molecule imparting some momentum um, onto a, a, the sides of a vessel, and that's how we would detecting pressure at a microscopic level. It's all to do with the number of moles. So if we have, in this case, we have 2N2O5 going to 4NO2 plus O2. Um, we can see we go from two moles of gas to five. So our pressure is going to almost double over the course of this reaction. So we could track down pressure as a proxy to concentration. Also remember when we're doing rates on gases, um, you know, we're looking at partial pressures, not necessarily that kind of concentration. 
So more pressure is very much a direct analogy to concentration. So we can get kinetic measurements of pressure. So let's just kind of review this. Uh, the method for an in situ, we introduce fewer errors. We've got less um, time error going back and forward. Um, so all our measurements are effectively instantaneous. Uh, it only takes a couple of seconds to run a UV spectrum or to get an IR spectrum. But you do need equipment, so it is a little bit of a limitation. Uh, one of the reasons that you'll do a quenching method in teaching labs is simply sitting down for a couple of hours with the same spectrometer. There's not enough equipment to go around dozens of undergraduates. It's, um, even in a research environment, you're likely not to be able to book an instrument for that long to do a really long-term kinetics um, experiment. You are very, very unlikely to do, say, get a hold of an NMR spectrometer and hold it at low temperature for 12 hours whilst you run a kinetic experiment on it. Um, so you're likely to do quenching and monitoring instead. So the methods for institute, we use spectroscopy, uh, conductivity or pressure, and these are the three things that we are going to cover predominantly in the next couple of lectures. So how do we get spectroscopy, spectroscopic measurements? How do we do conductivity measurements? How do we figure out pressure? Uh, so I'll put these slides in backwards, but never mind. Uh, the benefits and the limitations of um, the in situ methods I've kind of, in, I've kind of discussed already. So let's review what we've done. We are interested in the experimental considerations. What do we need to think about when it comes to taking kinetic measurements? We want to minimize the errors principally. Um, so that means even temperatures, even time, time, precise times that we want. And then we want the reagents to be mixed properly. Uh, if we start having temperature gradients or concentration gradients or we're quenching slowly, for instance, well, we'll, we'll introduce new errors that we don't want. Uh, quenching, we, that, this means stopping the reaction. Quenching just means, yeah, stopping the reaction. We can lower the temperature, we can dilute it, or we can add something that physically stops the reaction by mopping up the reagents. And then we measure it. Our main problem there is how efficient is that quenching? Does it take a couple of minutes or can it be stopped on a dime? And then we can overcome a lot of those by saying we can do in situ measurements by spectroscopic means, conductivity measurements of pressure. A few others might be out there, but these are the ones we're going to be interested in. Uh, so that's it for this introductory lecture. This is the first bit of the experimental considerations we're going to do. We're going to do these three especially in a lot more detail soon. Um, so until then, goodbye.